Good afternoon. I'd like to call the Putnam County Board of County Commissioners workshop for Tuesday, August 9th, 2022 to order. I'd like to welcome everybody here this afternoon. We'll begin our meeting with the invocation given by Commissioner Harvey and the pledge led by Commissioner Turner. Please stand if you're able. Let us bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, a day we've never experienced before in our life. Make us aware of our surroundings today. Make us aware of our struggles of our fellow man. Father, give us wisdom directly from your throne room for this meeting today and how we conduct county business. Father, we thank you for all the things you do for us and our families, how you protect our men and women in law enforcement and first responders. Father, we just thank you for the people who live by that page and put their life on hold to help our fellow man. Let us all be in that, in that attitude, Father, that we'll put our life on hold to help our fellow man. Father, we thank you for everything you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Harvey and Commissioner Turner. <coughs> Uh, first item of business is public comment on agenda items. This portion of the agenda is designed to allow citizens an opportunity to bring matters to the attention of the board. It's not reasonable but to expect that the board will engage in debate or deliberation about matters in which the board received no prior information. Uh, any individuals wishing to make public comment at this time? Okay, on agenda items? Okay. That's a no? Miscellaneous, okay, that will be at the end of the meeting. Okay, all right. Um, nobody wishing to make public comment on agenda items? Okay, we'll move down to the Port Authority. We have to wait, like we did this morning, just about a minute. Can't we move that up to three minutes after the hour or two minutes? <laughs> Yeah, we're just waiting for 2.05 before I can move to the next part of the agenda. So, okay, it's 2.05, so I'll recess the Board of County Commissioner workshop, and I'll convene the Port Authority workshop. Um, first item of business, item A, public comment on board, uh, Port Authority items. Any individual wishing to make public comment on Port Authority items? Okay, seeing none, any general discussion on Port Authority items? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to adjourn the... Port Authority Workshop, reconvene the regular Board of County Commissioners Workshop, and we'll move down to item A. This is a Parks and Recreation. This is a uh, presentation and request from the Placa Bay Ruth funding request. Uh, so I ask Mr. George Young to come up. Oh, he's coming up. Could you uh, mention that this has been the Parks and Rec Committee and heard already, please, sir? Okay, yeah, George is going to mention that and make some comments on that, but as um, I'm the chairman of the board of um, the Parks and Recs Committee, and this presentation was presented to our board uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was really pleased that we pretty much had a full board that day. There was definitely a lot of discussion about this. Uh, some of the members uh, that were that are on the board or have been lived in Putnam County all their life and they remember uh, what a viable and active facility that has been. And also uh, back uh, a number of years ago, the amount of tournaments that it were be able to be held there. And uh, this request is going to hopefully, if passed, uh, start the, the process of moving those facilities back and getting them into the shape uh, where they can host tournaments and build that program back up again. But it was unanimously recommended by the Parks and Recs uh, Advisory Board uh, to move this forward to the request of the uh, Board of County Commissioners, so we approved it. So, George? You still need, need me to go through the whole spill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, all of you know me from one capacity or another. 
The capacity I'm in here today, though, is I'm currently the board president for Palaka Babe Ruth. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar. Many of you have family members that some even serve on our board, many of them that participate, grandchildren. I've seen some of you out there on the fields, uh, friends, family. You're familiar with Babe Ruth. This county has a long and storied history with Babe Ruth, the man, um, more so than a lot of other communities. Uh, he spent a lot of time here. He didn't just come down and visit. He held training. He, he held training sessions for players. He participated in the community. He lived here some in the off season. There's just a long and storied history. The Babe Ruth program has a long and storied history as well. Long before my time of, of coming to the county. Um, and I still hear stories from clients all the time about the relationships they built, the things they did, how their coaches mentored them, uh, the friendships they developed from a robust baseball program through Babe Ruth. Now, we also have a softball program through Babe Ruth as well. We have t-ball, baseball, and softball. The softball program has grown tremendously. Um, they utilize Triangle Field for the most part as part of our agreement with the county. So uh, I think there's other things underway for improvements there. But if you go out to the field, Francis Field, or Francis Youth Complex, whatever you like to call it, there are a few of the old banners left up on the fence. From tournaments, from days when there were folks there that were named players of the tournament or hosting uh, Babe Ruth tournaments, hosting non-Babe Ruth tournaments. Um, what we have run into is that we had a very vibrant program growing. Uh, Cody Hacker, my press, my press, uh, the guy before me. <laughs> He's done a great job of building up the program. Then COVID hit. When COVID hit, we took a hit because we were into our spring season, which is our biggest season, where typically we'd have around 300, somewhere between three and 400 players. And two games into the season, COVID shut us down. Um, when we came back, um, I was amazed to see it, how enthusiastic everybody was to show up for Babe Ruth. It was like an opportunity to get outside, have fun, do something again. We've been rebuilding the program. Um, this past year, we had over 240 participants uh, during the spring season. We're looking at a, possibly a reduced fall season because now we have Pop Warner football and a bunch of other things that are competing. So we're trying to, we're trying to be good neighbors and work with these other organizations. But what we don't have right now on what used to be a beautiful facility is a simple ability to reliably play ball when it's dark. I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot of places where you don't play organized baseball under the lights. There are some out there, but this one's had lights and has had it for a long time. The equipment's old, outdated, hard to replace, difficult to work on, et cetera, et cetera. So I understand that the commission previously approved $40,000 for repair. What Babe Ruth is asking for is instead of putting that $40,000 towards repair, and yes, I'm here to ask for money or ask for you to approve money, not for Babe Ruth, for the county. This improves a county facility that benefits everyone that participates in baseball, but it's fallen to us to take the lead on this thing. 110,000 additional dollars, because if you put the 110 and the 40 together, based on our talking to different companies and organizations, that repair the lights, replace them with LEDs, just like they've done at the city and done at the Placa and Crescent City. Similar systems, we could probably get the quadplex, which is the main four fields that everybody plays on, done for that amount of money. Um, that's the beginning. That would still leave us two fields out there to go, but we're willing to work with the commission and do what we can to raise more funds, get more, whatever we gotta do to try to replace those, those lights as well. What we have undertaken up till now is we have, as Babe Ruth, the organization, replaced four scoreboards, four of the six scoreboards for the county. We came up with the funds, had them installed, donated time and the equipment. We've got two left to go, which we're committed to trying to get done by the spring season. Um, we had one of our sponsors repair the roof, uh, the overhang there at the uh, concession stand. I think he said he spent probably around $3,000, donated that. Holbrook Metals was able to fabricate new stairs so that the upstairs to that building could be used, which we couldn't because the stairs were so bad they were a danger to even try to climb up on. Now, he didn't donate everything, but he, he donated all the labor and work, 
and all the county paid for was the reduced materials. Um, Southern Air, I could go on and on about different organizations that <coughs> have helped us invest in what we're trying to do here, which is build a community sport uh, that's got a long and storied history for the benefit of the community. The benefits to the county for this, though, <coughs> go beyond Babe Ruth. You've got travel teams, you've got other teams out there that play ball, you've got folks that show up. I don't know if you've been out there on a Sunday afternoon, there are folks showing up and play ball all the time. It's a great facility. It's just gotten old and a little outdated. The primary concern, and there are a list of concerns, but the primary concern that we get it back on, on its feet and get it moving and allow us to put in again to a host tournaments, whether they're Babe Ruth, just Babe Ruth tournaments or the pre-state tournaments or the state tournaments for the Babe Ruth World Series, we've got to start somewhere. And lights is one of them, is the major thing. It's a safety issue and it's the ability to use issue. If you got two or three lights out, kid goes to shag a fly ball in short center field, which we had on one of the fields, can't see it when it's dark. Mm -hmm. Ball hits him or hits somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Now, the benefit beyond Babe Ruth here, one, it grows our program, so we have more people involved. Uh, but if we're able to host these tournaments, these are huge monetary events for the county. The, just the Babe Ruth tournaments that we participate in, you usually have four days, two to four days worth of tournaments from people from six, seven counties around. They need Babe Ruth sponsored tournaments to go to before they can play in the state tournaments. Um, everybody knows the rules when you showed up at a Babe Ruth or Cal Ripken sponsored tournament um, and you're bringing in hundreds of people and they're gonna stay the night because they're gonna play and be in play and be there for two to four days. That's not my purpose. I think it's a great side benefit to the community but my purpose is to provide a facility we can be proud of. You own it, I don't. Babe Ruth has a commitment to work on the fields. That's part of our deal with the county. We do a lot of mowing, we do a lot of raking, we do a lot of dirt hauling, we do a lot of fix it here, fix it there. And because we have a great group of volunteers, we're able to do that. It, it, it strains us sometimes that we're able to do that. We've got a great partnership, I think, with your Parks and Rec Department. They've gone out of their way out of the way to accommodate us on, on all of our requests and to help us out. But $110,000 is a little beyond what I can raise at Babe Ruth right now. So I'd like to focus on the little things we can repair to benefit the county. I call them little, but they're major. Scoreboards, those type things, so you can utilize all the fields. And I'm requesting, and again, when we talk to the Parks and Rec, I'm not sure, advisory board, is that if I addressed that correctly? Yeah. And we discussed this, there was a lot of back and forth about a lot of different issues, but um, they approved this unanimously to recommend this to the commission. Now, I understand that's just a recommendation. It's up to the folks that are here. But I would appreciate it if you would take this step and helping us help you move forward for something I believe is a great community project and something that will benefit the county. Thank you. Okay, thank you, George. Um, start with questions, Commissioner Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> you had me before you ever came up here. I read my packet and I'm ready to make a motion, but I, that's not what I want to say. Growing up out there in Francis, we didn't play ball there. I hunted that property and um, squirrel hunted that property actually and back towards the airport. And um, we played across from Francis Baptist Church in a little field and we'd borrow paper plates from mom or the neighbor and run down there and put, that's how we had our bases. So that, that area has come near and dear to my heart. Not only that, the board has said that with the ARPA funds going to Triangle Park or Theobald Park, you know, and now we can do this one, then we can work on some parks in West Putnam. We, our kids need something. So um, as long as we can get that sign, we talked about that. I went out there and tried to fix that sign about a month ago, but there's no fixing to that sign, so we got to make them uniform throughout the county. I'd love to see that sign look like the one we did over at East Palacca and make it look the same. But, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, I'd like to make a motion that we approve this this um, request. I'll second that. Okay, we got a proper motion by Commissioner Harvey to approve the request of Babe Ruth, and um, we'll move down to more commissioner questions and comments. Commissioner Turner. Uh, yes, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that it makes perfectly good sense here instead of taking forty thousand dollars and just doing a repair that's only going to last six months or a year 
that we take 110 additional thousand dollars and do something that's going to last for some time into the future with modern lights and modern and pole upgrades and whatever needs to be done here to make it uh, much better. Otherwise, we're going to be spending another 40,000 or more next year and another 40,000 or more the following year. So it, you know, it actually makes good, to me, it makes good financial sense for the county to go ahead and fix this and be done with it and have an upgraded modern field there. So that's the reason I seconded your motion. Um, the other thing is, is don't forget about my community park in East Palaco over there. I've oh, asked the Rex if I parked and wrecked, but I don't think it's made it to a bit. But <laughs> I've asked them to look at it, please. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, I think this is what we ought to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Commissioner Adams, Act. Where, where would the funding for this come from? General Fund Reserves. So my only hesitation here, and I, I support the Babe Ruth and doing everything you're talking about, but we have other things on this agenda, and we got two more agendas before the budget, final budgets passed. Um, I just, the timing of it, I think, might not be the best. I, I would rather hear this in October after we know exactly what we look like with our budget for next year. Um, that's just my take on it. Um, I don't fully have a grasp. We just got all the finite details the other day I have some ideas on what I'd like to see done with the budget that I'm going to present to the board when our next budget hearing comes about and uh, I'm not ready to do this without a little bit further discussion around the budget for next year but thank you okay Commissioner Rawls <clears throat> well Commissioner Adams I uh, got one of my questions knocked out way which is where's the funding coming from you know in next year's budget is one hundred thirty five thousand dollars for <clears throat> for maintenance for parks and recreation um, you know this is one of the situations where when I first got elected I made it very clear that I would be in favor of the government getting out of the way and turning the parks over to an NGO like yourself that could come in we give you um, basic maintenance you know we maintain light stuff like that but you guys um, basically do the heavy lifting as an association raise money keep the money run run the thing the way you want and basically we're letting it be your your park to run um, I think in, in, in that, that sense, it makes a lot more sense. Then we have a, a real true partnership. Um, and it pains me to, you know, to hear you say, well, you know, so-and-so had to do, donate a roof and so-and-so had to donate some stairs and um, such-and-such um, gave us the money for the scoreboard signs. I'm glad that you all are able to do that. But in a lot of other communities, they actually do that, where the parents set up an association, they get a memorandum of understanding or some sort of a contractual agreement with the, the government agency, and they're able to take that as their own raise money, put up LED lights, come to the, the county and say, hey, we've got half the money, can you help us get the other half? Go after grant money because as a nonprofit, you guys can qualify and apply for grants just as quick as we can. But I think uh, Commissioner Amzak is absolutely correct. We're way late in the year. We're, I don't even know how much money we've spent out of reserves from last year. I'm, um, you know, I'm on page 28 out of 177 going through um, the line on a breakdown that we just got. So I think um, this should be something that should be put in in October, I don't think you're going to get done between now and October, anyways. Even if we approve the money, um, the way you know the way the government works, you're not going to be able to get the work done that quickly. But um, I, I think that uh, we're also, you know, are stepping on a lot of toes by doing this. We've had a ton of other nonprofits come in here in the past 365 days, and this diocese has told them we don't support nonprofits. We're not going to fund nonprofits, and. Um, I wasn't one of those voices. I didn't stand behind that, but I can, you know, I'm part of this commission, and that was the position that the commission took. Is that an alarm? No, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, so I, I think, you know, we have to be cautious there as well, but we, we, we do need to get through the rest of this budget cycle and see what we really look like. Um, we may have tons of money in Octo on October 1st in reserve money to be able to throw an extra $110,000 um, at, at the field, but... What about the other fields? That's that's the other question. And I understand you guys are Bay Ruth, but you know Melrose, um, they've got their association. You've you've got the group out in, in Florham that's done a great job with theirs. And then that that raises the question: Where do we draw the line? You know, should we not be having interaction with the Parks and Recreation Advisory um, uh, Committee coming in and advising the commission and telling us, hey, you know, let's take a strategically look at these parks and recreational areas and decide in this order what um, what, what what is most important and where we want to focus our efforts, um, because I think that we, we could very easily step on a lot of toes if we're not careful. Just speak to 
one thing, just to make sure the commission is clear. Yes. We're not here to ask for money for Babe Ruth. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're here to ask you to put money into your facility. We will benefit, but so will others. I just don't want to make you think that yeah. we're asking for this money. This is ours. Right. No one else is stepping up. So I'm here. Sorry about the timing. I am. I understand. That's a. I would have that same concern. I would. Um, but I strike when I can. If you, if you reached out to 110 companies and asked them to donate a thousand dollars a piece, what do you think your percentage would be? Don't know. I know I've reached out to quite a few in the community because we are working towards trying to raise a fair amount of money for the final two fields because those lights will be more expensive. There's more of them. They're bigger. Uh, but and to get the school boards up. So I can't answer to what 110 companies would tell you. I tell you I've gotten a real good response out of six. But again, this, it, it's heavy lifting. The, if it were just for Babe Ruth, I would agree with you. But this isn't just for Babe Ruth. And it, it's the facility we get to use. Now we are growing, expanding, bringing in some new teams from South Putnam. Belarus has their own Babe Ruth organization. We play them, have a good time. <laughs> Short travel, fun. This is the center of the county. Francis Field is about as center as you're going to get for a field, and it's center to where a lot of people come to play ball. Am I a little biased because that's where Babe Ruth is playing baseball? Absolutely. But from a strategic standpoint, it's got a lot of value there, too. All I can do is ask. I appreciate it. Yep. Okay. I guess I've, if yeah. I was y'all, I would push hard He's for that, that so agreement. Not, uh, He's not done yet. That wasn't done yet. If, if I was y'all, I would, I would actually push for that, that type of agreement. If you, if you can get the parents in favor of that, you know, if mind, your, your athletic associations in Jacksonville are, are very, very strong up there. They're and, and they're, like you said, the business owners, kids play ball, their grandkids play ball. They're willing to step up and help um, put sponsorship signs, stuff like that out. Which we do. The problem is there's a limit to the money out there as well. Yep. The community decides. So we're, we're trying to strike a balance right now, but it's an idea I certainly will pursue. Make my phone ring. Okay. All right. Commissioner Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that's where I was going to start with. We need to understand that Babe Ruth ain't asking for anything except for us to fix our stuff to where it makes their play better and the other people in the community. That's one of the things we need to be doing here is, is making our recreation facilities the best we can as we can <coughs> possibly do it. They weren't able to do a lot of it in the last uh, 10 years prior to three years ago because the budgets were either stale or they remain or they actually went down in value because of the uh, property values and I still think that it makes good business sense for us not to pour forty thousand dollars into maintenance on the existing lights and the existing lights and it's only going to fix about a third of the existing lights if I understand correctly so you're going to have two-thirds that's going to have to be fixed next year mm -hmm. just to keep them where they already are now to where if we put the other 110,000 in there we have brand new lights brand new lights LED the the uh, cost of, of the electricity on the field will help tremendously over I believe they got halogen lights in there now I'm not sure but it, it'd be a lot less money to, to run the LED so you know, I just think we need to go and do this. I do share some concerns about the budget, and I think we're fine with the budget with our reserves we currently have. And I, I'm going to vote for this. I think we need to try to get this ball, this ball field. And you know, they could ask for all six to be done at one time. If you want to be perfectly honest about it, they didn't. They came in here and said, if you'll get four playable and you'll get four where they'll really operate well, we'll try to get the other two done if we can. If we can't raise it all we'll come back and see you again but I'm just telling you they, did, they didn't ask for the they didn't ask for a Cadillac they asked for us just to get them going again with a good solid Buick <laughs> so uh, anyhow said Buick, but, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow I'm going to support this Mr. Chairman okay all right Commissioner Adams acting will call, I'll call well, then Commissioner Rawls and I'll call <coughs> the question so we, we still got to look at our whole entire county as a whole you know talking to JR, between meetings, you know, there's surrounding counties that are looking to give their fire services huge bumps in pay and things like that that we can't keep up with. We have to figure out a way how to, how to bridge that gap a little bit and $110,000 goes a long way towards that. And fire service and police and that stuff. I, I love parks, I have four little kids. They, they all participate in all of this stuff. But 
I have to prioritize other mandates that we have in the county, and I don't know that I'm, I'm at a point where I think we have $110,000 to, to prioritize this over chasing some of those things that we have to prioritize. We have to prioritize that. Um, we're gonna be bleeding firefighters again if these surrounding counties actually go through with what their plans are. They were, they're already talking about it and voting on it in other counties. Um, so it's a, it's a big concern for me. And like I said, if this was October and we had our budget finalized, and we had 1.3 million between above the 10% or whatever, I'd be like, yeah, we could do that. I don't know if we're there yet. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Rawls. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to restate it again. I agree with Commissioner Adams Act that I think we do need to wait until we get our budget finalized. We're we're we're, we're going to step on so many toes, least of all our employees. That you know, we told them that we couldn't take them north of $13 an hour right now because uh, we're we're strapped. There, we we really need to have more more of a conversation than just 60 seconds and we're in emotion. I think we need to go through the rest of our budget process, include this if that's the direction we're going to go, put this as part of our, uh, part of our strategic spending, but um, not coming in here late in the, the, the uh, third or earlier the fourth quarter of the year and then um, trying to slam this in. This just doesn't feel right, so I, I will not be voting in support of this right now. I'd like to take a look at this um, post-October 1st. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rawls. Uh, Commissioner Turner? Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to change their mind, and they're not going to change mine, so just please, I'm going to unlight my button and call for questions. Okay, we've got a proper motion on the floor by Commissioner Harbin, a proper second by Commissioner Turner. All in favor, indicate saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. aye. Okay, passes three to two with Commissioner Rawls, Commissioner Adams, Act dissenting. Okay, George, thank you very much. Commissioners, I appreciate your time with us. Thank you. Thank George. you. Okay, we'll move down to item B. Uh, we'll start with administration on the land development code update and contract negotiations with EXP services. Julianne. Yes, sir. As you'll remember, we did an RFP for a, land, a contract for a company to help us with our land development code update. The contract, uh, the RFP committee brought to you a rank order for which you approved. Contract negotiations began with that top ranked firm. The original cost proposal for an all-inclusive product was $322,000. We were able to negotiate some areas of it where we felt like based on uh, after conversations, multiple conversations with our internal staff as well as the top ranked firm staff where we could reduce the number of man hours required but still end with an all-inclusive product that will address our update needed for the land development code. The final negotiated contract that we're bringing you today is 267, 667 and eight cents. We did originally budget $150,000 that number was an arbitrary number. It was a basis to get us something budgeted, and it does come from general fund reserves because this is a one-time cost. This is not something we would use on reoccurring expenses. Um, that We're not going to have an LDC update every single year. So this, we too, would make up the difference from the original budgeted dollars that we've been carrying forward and the difference of 117,668 from general fund reserves and we are seeking the board's recommendation and direction. Okay, thank you, Julianne. So this is roughly every 10 years, these, the comprehensive plan and then the land development code is looked at, correct? Yes, sir, that's my understanding. Okay. Or it could be even longer. Could be even longer, okay. All right, Commissioner Turner. Um, could you tell me, I meant to ask you this question when we met and talked on this earlier, but is uh, this a not to exceed is this a, because the way they laid out the pricing in the budget, it's like so many hours of a project manager and so many hours of this. And, and if, is that a not to exceed or if it takes less hours when they go through it or if they're going to have 15 public forums but they only end up having 14, would it be less money? So is this, so is this yes. a, basically a not to exceed this amount of money? This would be a not to exceed unless obviously something comes up and then we would be back to you with saying, uh, oh, this was an unforeseen. But yes, they would have to bill based on actual staff hours allocated to the project. And so our total project layout would be a not to exceed 267. If we get to that number based on what we project, then we'll be right there. If we come in a little less, we come in a little less. If it goes over, obviously we'll go through the process. So the 267, basically, we've already got all but 117,668 budgeted, 
and we've been trying to get the, to this point for three and a half years. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Rawls. <clears throat> so, in reading through this, it, I understand this is a smorgasbord. Um, it does not feel like we have everything identified, uh, but at one point they say that uh, they're going to identify LDC revision areas by policy and need. Who will who will determine that policy and need, and when will that be done? So there's a to that will be a there's a total of thirty something meetings. Mm -hmm. That will be citizen input. That will be board input. That will be staff input. And any idea how many are how many citizens? Uh, are these going to be like visioning sessions or citizen sessions that will be had? Will they be around the community? That is the intent. Yes. Okay. Um, so the, the, the part where they say they have um, 10 hours for the, the policy issues and policy um, identification, does that seem like a real, a real number? Like, it just seems to me like it, it, it almost seems like it's almost not enough time um, allocated to that one, the, the most important portion of this, because that's going to drive the, the creation of our LDC and what articles and what, what gets amended, what doesn't get amended. Based on staff's review, as well as the firm's area of expertise, reviewing our LDC and what is needed, that is what their projection is, yes, sir. And that includes the 10, that 10 hours includes public engagement? I don't think so. No, the public engagement, I believe, is a whole separate section. Okay, that was, okay, that was my question. You said that, that would come partially from the public. So um, I couldn't find where this other hour, it, it only had that one line that, that delineated that, so it's kind of hard to maybe 10 lines, but um, you, you think there's more time dedicated somewhere else in here for the public? For the public, yes, sir. Okay, and that they will have specific input into the policy areas? They will be able to give their input to EXP, who will then filter in what is reasonable and should be considered into the LDC. And are we talking live, online, or hybrid? Our intent is live. Can we make them hybrid? I think I think a lot of people nowadays, um, with the, the the value added uh, with hybrid meetings, um, like I said before, the city of Placa has a lot of an engagement with their their folks. Uh, a lot more people could could be involved that way. I think we, we really should be taking a look that. at that. Absolutely. And there was another. Um, I actually had this highlighted, and then for some reason it didn't save on my computer. So, hang on just a second. Um, Oh, the updated zoning map. So, the the current the current maps that we have right now, um, how far out do we really think those are to to, to be going through and um, re-updating the zoning again? I can't answer. We just that. went through that. I'm sorry. We just went through that not too long ago. That may be it's just not my area of expertise. Okay. My job is to make sure we get to a final negotiated contract. I know that's been a point of contention uh, with with uh, the folks in planning and zoning because the 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 Gabriel. Um, could you, you repeat the that? question? Yeah, <laughs> I look at the periphery and there he is. <laughs> <laughs> the question was about the zoning maps. Yeah. What about the zoning maps? Again? So how far out are we right now, in your opinion, with what we need and wh where we need to be? Um, with regard to new zoning maps? Mm -hmm. So that would be um, at the very end of the land development code revision. So our land use and our zoning will all? Right. Okay. So once the land development code is um, revised where it needs to be revised, then we would look at the zoning map and <clears throat> it'll also be um, <clears throat> based on what the policy of the board is as well. So if the board wanted to change zonings um, in certain areas of the county um, to redirect um, certain types, excuse me, <clears throat> certain types of development, then uh, you could do that at that point. Um, so we have the newly adopted future land use maps, uh, but we, we won't have those zoning maps probably for about a year and a half or two years, the new zoning maps that will align with the the land use correct um most why, of why the, so long well because normally that comes at the very end of the land development code revision process this is a two-year sure. process sorry this is a two-year process approximately that's what we're anticipating um now it may be shorter um depending on how much there is to to revise um but I am anticipating about a year and a half to two years. Um, 
but right now the zoning maps that we have are pretty consistent with our land use. Um, we have just a few areas that need to be changed, um, but for the most part, they're consistent. Okay. That's all I have right now. Okay. Um, so most of the interaction will be will be live, is what you're hoping. Yeah. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay, and then the planning commission will be involved in this just as they were with the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. So, so it'll go to them first, mm -hmm. and then come back to us. Okay. All right. My question too. Okay, I'm Commissioner good. Harvey. I'm good. Okay. Right, you answered the question. Okay. Um, any other discussion, commissioners? What's the pleasure? I move that this uh, moves forward to the uh, consent agenda for 267, 668. Okay, we got a proper motion second. to move this item forward by Commissioner Turner, proper second by Commissioner Harvey. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor, and I'm going to say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, <coughs> passes unanimously. Okay, we'll move down to item C, general services, AC automation upgrade. Um, Julianne, you want to start this one too? Yes, sir, I can. Do you, um, you mind if I start? No, sir, I don't. <laughs> I've been coming in this building longer than I've been a commissioner. Back years ago, when it was designed, it was designed with a set of controls that there was only one person that seemed like in the Southeast United States, his name was Jim Brown, that could come in here and adjust the controls and make them work. Unfortunately, Jim's good, he's a good man and a good friend, but unfortunately he fell off a ladder and killed himself not purposely, but it was an act, a terrible, tragic accident. But ever since that reason I tell that story is that every single, every since then, we haven't had anybody with the, the ability to work on this particular kind of control. The other entities that use this particular kind of control, such as the school board back when they did back in the day, they had to change their controls out. And until we change the controls, and do some a few unit upgrades, which is what this money is today, we are not ever going to be able to cool this building and heat this building and do it correctly. I, excuse me. I think what we're going to find is, is that just being able to control the temperature in this building where one room isn't freezing and the next room over you have to take off your jacket and everything else and still sweat because it's so hot, I was in legal the other day, God bless Tabitha. I mean, <laughs> right. uh, it was so hot in there that I couldn't breathe, and that's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and if they've got to close the door where they can't blow air in there with a fan, a floor fan, then they, then they, <laughs> it gets 90 plus degrees in there. We're, us being able to control the temperature in this building will pay a big chunk of this in energy savings because we're not trying to blow the air in one side, in one room to make it cold enough that you can stand, or cool enough that you can stand to be in the next room. Right. This has been needed for quite some time, um, quite some time. I mean, right now you could walk around this building, every, any, anybody in here, and you'll find like right now the lobby is <coughs> 15 degrees warmer than it is in our lobby right here if you just walk through that door I noticed it earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, most of it is the controls in the ceiling that either don't operate or they're not hooked into the, to the unit when they're upgraded, when the unit's upgraded or whatever. I think, guys, I think this is a, a necessary thing that we try to move forward and get this to where it's an operable system in this building. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Rawls? <clears throat> is there anybody here that can speak about this system? Tim? All right. I'm trying to wrap my head around some technical questions that I have. <clears throat> so, some visuals to give you an idea of what we have. No, I, I just I, yeah. I need some questions answered. I guess so. Is Suite we're in Suite 100, Suite 200 is next door. Is that um, one rooftop unit or two separate units? Over 200. 100 and 200. This is this has three rooftop units. Suite 200 has two. Okay, so the control has four. The controls for Suite 100 will not impact suite 200, is that correct? No, sir. No, okay. it's separate. Right. Separate controls. So the, um, the, you have two rooftop units over suite 200. 
Um, are they all open, all closed, or are there, is there variable air volume boxes separating areas? VAV boxes. Uh, one of them we've had to drop a thermostat down in the return duct to get it functioning. Okay, you're, you're heading the right direction. Then. Okay, so if, if you if you were to do that, where you you go from DDC and just go to your your traditional analog type to get us by, um, what would that take? How many VAV boxes are you talking? I don't have a count of them with me right now. I could look into it, but. More than like 10, you think? Quite a few of them. More than 10? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, and are, are, um, are you adding uh, a, a transformer and a thermostat when you did that one where you dropped it down? Each room would, uh, no, it's just a thermostat dropped down into the return. Where room. are you powering the thermostats from? Sir? Where are you getting your power for the thermostats? From the, from the unit. From the VAB, so you're just going from the VAB, it's already powered. I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, in, in the short term, uh, what the cost would be instead of rushing forward to spend $100,000 here. Um, if we could take a look at that and see what the net effect might be uh, versus running, running out, because it, uh, what is the average age of the rooftop units? Are they all 14 plus years old? Uh, around 20. So should we not be having a holistic conversation about taking a look at maybe looking at replacing units and at that point looking at digital controls if we're gonna go in that direction? That's the direction we're going is with digital controls. No, no, I'm, but if, if your rooftop units are 20 years old, um, does it make sense that we're looking at replacing the, the, uh, the controls now versus, you know, we have a simple inexpensive solution that can be deployed easily. I mean, we can go get White Rogers thermostats off the shelf from. Uh, it's, it's interchangeable. If you hook up new controls to this old, uh, old HVAC unit, you disconnect it and hook up the new unit once you put a new HVAC system up. What I'm saying is why not wait until we do all that versus saving the money right now? I, what Can you spitball, is it less than $500 per VAV box to get a thermostat? I would imagine your thermostat's for less than 100 bucks. You got some 18-2 wire? I don't know how much it is individually for per VAV box. I have a quote for each section of the complex. So this is something that was not done in-house or cannot be done in-house? No, sir, we can't do it in-house. Who did the last one that, where they dropped the thermostat down? I'm just curious. We put the thermostat in-house. We didn't do, we don't do the automation controls. So do we need automation controls? That's what the system's designed for. No, no I'm, I mean, but. relying on the VAV boxes to be told whether to open or close. So if we, if we set a thermostat for 76 degrees, that that would sustain, that area would sustain 76 degrees. It's not going to be evenly distributed. Why the VAV would open up like a, a so a digital control has a thermostat. We've or, got the VAV is forced open right now because the automation isn't working. We're, there's static pressure that you're relying on to evenly distribute that mm -hmm. controlled environment. Without the VAV boxes being only closed portionally or fully open, it's not being evenly distributed. That's where we're getting the mix of 80 degrees over here, 60 degrees on the other side. So my, my, my question is simple. Why, why are we looking to spend $110,000 on controls and not taking a look at all of our air conditioning solutions right now? So that throw these controls in and then six months later you lose a rooftop unit. The automation side and the mechanical side are two separate issues. It, they're in it. We can put new HVAC controls in mm -hmm. and hook them up to the old system and then replace that HVAC system and they will hook, it'll hook right up to the new controls. So you don't, you don't think when you change the HVAC uh, rooftop units you're looking to change from VAV to something different like DX um, or, or uh, split systems? I think that's that's something that we really need to have a conversation about because we could be a lot more electrically efficient if we went with a uh, variable variable uh, refrigerant flow system where we had multiple controls and multiple um, cassettes, whether they're ceiling mounted, wall mounted, or um, pancake air compressors with traditional ductwork distribution. But be a lot more money, though, wouldn't it? If, if we look, if we have 20-year-old units, we're on borrowed time. I think we just need to take a look at, at uh, what it's going to take, you know, instead of throwing $110,000 away and um, 
you know, coming back a year or two from now and having to replace everything, it can be very, very expensive. Same thing, you know, same issue in the courthouse. You got that old chilled water system that's, that's extremely inefficient. And it's on its last leg, and we just keep throwing Band-Aids on it. Um, I just don't know that, that uh, replacing the controls is necessarily there. I think that there is a, a much less costly um, solution. We just, what, what's been put in front of me is just one possibility, and I, I wonder, you know, what have we done internally to get the best value for the taxpayers to get us by until we decide what we're going to do on the entire building. Okay. I mean, why, why do we need, I guess the yeah. question that keeps ringing my head is, do we need um, so, a, a system that one person can log into right now? Because that's what you're, it sounds like you're going to, it's going to have some sort of interface and probably a touchpad. Um, I just installed one to the job we're working on. They're great. Um, and I logged in on my phone the other day, and it was very frustrating because the, the, the communication between Wi-Fi and this system when I was over in St. Augustine was just extremely slow. And I was just playing around to see what it was like. But um, I don't, at the end of the day, I, don't, I really don't see the value in being able to log in have, you know, versus having somebody on site, which we have every day here. It's also a good diagnostic tool. I can, if I get a complaint about an area, I can log in and see what system's doing what. If it's not functioning at all, where the problem is, whether I'm getting a good supply temp or a bad return temp. I mean, it's also a good diagnostic tool. But you're you're going to the point that I'm making because you've got 20 year old equipment that doesn't have a lot of controls capability, and you can't see all the. I mean. I can log in, I can, I can see the fan speed, I can see the relative humidity, I can um, increase or decrease the temperature, I can look at the, the reheat on, on the side of it. You, there's a lot of stuff you can do because these new systems have a lot more in, um, integration in them. I'm just afraid that if we go running down that road and we buy this control system and then we put these out for bids and Aon comes in and Train comes in and Curie comes in and each one has their own control system, then we're buying a whole new control system at the end of the day. No, it hooks up to the same system. Your your automation will hook up to the HVAC system. It, I can assure you the system that we just installed is is, is proprietary to Aon. Okay. And, and that's because we bought Aon equipment. So Johnson Controls couldn't come in and, and run theirs. They have their they have their own control side of their, their corporation. That's all I'm saying. Okay. All right, Commissioner Adams Act. I know nothing about anything that he said or you said, so I'm not going to go down any of those paths. Um, so if we did this, how would we pay for it? General fund reserves, I assume? General fund reserves, sir. Um, and it says that. If, uh, my question was, in talking to Sean, and, and I, was it you I was talking to on the phone to, it sounded like they already kind of chose the vendor who's going to supply this, or are we going to go through regular procurement? Well, it will be regular procurement, but it is a single source because we do already have the same controls in other areas. So it is adding on to an existing system. So there isn't multiple vendors that could do those type controls? It's proprietary controls. So essentially, once you've already gone down the road with one, you have a single source scenario where it is in the best interest of the county to continue with that vendor. Okay. Mr. Turner? Uh, yes. Um, you know, I just want to bring it to everybody's attention that we've pieced and parsed this thing, uh, uh, pieced and parted this thing for years. And we've done some new controls in some new areas, but they're not in the areas where we're having the difficulty with. And I don't think it matters which company you use as long as you have a company that's going to service or product that you have more than one vendor that can come in when something happens instead of relying on one person, one man, and if something happens to that person, you can't use controls. I mean, I know that Siemens control, Johnson controls, whatever controls that you, that you select, they'll hook up to anybody's air conditioning unit and make that air conditioning unit work. And so I, I just think we need to continue down this path. And, you know, we could go the route Commissioner Rawls is talking about without any doubt, but I'd be willing to bet the belt I was holding my britches up that you can't. <laughs> Um, that you can't do it for less than $110,000. This is just moving us another step in that direction, one piece at a time to get us where we finally want to be when the units are changed out. 
So I stopped betting my shoes because I lost them the other day. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, anyhow, uh, with that being said, Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to move this forward. Is that a motion? Yes, sir. Okay, we got a promo motion. Move this item forward. Second. Got a proper second by Commissioner Harvey. Commissioner Rawls, you have questions? Uh, you, well, before you leave, so is this JCI? Sorry. Who's the vendor? <laughs> the vendor's Professional Cooling. Who? Professional Cooling. I, I, <clears throat> I'm not familiar with them, so I, you know, not that I have to know of every vendor out there that deals with HVAC. Where are they out of? Jacksonville. Okay, and who are they? What controls are they installing? Distech. Wow. So the, <clears throat> the further this conversation goes down the road, I'm, I'm not familiar with anybody that you've just discussed. So um, what is their depth of, I mean, who, who are they backed by? Who are their, who are they backed yeah, by? Do, are, is it, this is their own proprietary control system? This is what they specialize in, yes. You said DISTEC, D-I-S-T-E-C-K? Uh, C-H. DISTEC controls. Um, And what, what kind of warranty do we get when they come in? Two years. And they're, they're changing out everything from every unit. Um, they're going to be bringing in the interface. How, how is that going to be? What, what, what do we have to supply? Are they going to do any wiring, any wireways? The, the system Mr. Turner talked about from Jim Brown, they're going to, that's been worked on in hodgepodge so many times, they're going to remove all that. Okay. They're going to re rewire everything. We're getting new wall sensors, duct sensors, the controllers. The way that's set up now here in this building, they're located up in the ceiling tiles. Uh, what they're going to do is wire everything into a central location per suite. So suite 100 has a centralized 200, 300, uh, and get us away from having to dig around on the ceiling looking for them. Okay, and then they're all going to be connected into our network and somebody will be able to log in. Uh, but they're back. Are they, is this backnet or is this backnet? This is backnet. Um, yeah, that's old school. I'm just saying we're 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 not getting on the front edge of anything. So you know, we, you know, I, I don't want the employees to be uncomfortable in their working environment. I think it's important that they, that they be productive and be be comfortable. Um, but uh, just looking at their at their website here. Um, doesn't look like there's anything special that they're offering, and I think when it comes time to get new equipment, no, we're probably going to be spending a lot, a lot of this money again. But we'll, uh, I'm not going to vote against this. We need to get it moved forward. Um, I would like to say, though, that the conversation we've had says we've been kicking this can around for a very long time. Obviously, staff is frustrated having to deal with the heat. You guys are frustrated having to deal with this thing on a recurrent basis. But this should have been put in in a line item and funded last year, this year, you know, it shouldn't be coming up. Hey, we have to deal with this as an emergency now. Um, and that, that's, you know, that's something that we need to deal with as a commission, being able to support you guys in the field. So you do have this as in, in your budget, knowing that you have the money upcoming to be able to do this and not have to come in here on, a, you know, on an emergency basis like this or whatever we call it, wherever we're calling this. But um, I thank you for your time. Okay, we've got a proper motion, a proper second. All in favor, and it could say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, item moves forward. Okay, item D, um, public works, St. John's drainage improvement project, deductive change order, and gopher tortoise services needed. Mr. Chairman. Um, Mike Nimitz. Before this starts, could I ask a question of Ms. Young? I think it's her, or maybe it's Mike. Maybe I'll try, I'll start you with Mike. <laughs> Will DOT allow us to take the deductive change order that, you're, that, they, that has been proposed and use it to move the gopher tortoises with it? In other words, yes. Okay, that's why I didn't know who to ask. Well, I, I understood that was the my other first day. question. Yeah. So we have. I mean, you. I'm not trying to steal your thunder. Or just don't want to hear it for two hours unless somebody else does. But the so basically, if we. If we take the deductive change order, we'll actually have a lower overall contract than we would have before, so all the money's budgeted. Mm -hmm. And this project's already been approved, it's already mm -hmm. been everything, 
So it's just a matter of what we're talking about today is we're gonna take the deductive change order and pay for the gophers that have been found. Mm -hmm. That's, that's to make sure I was on board. Commissioner, that's correct. The offsetting change orders will result in a contingency of twenty-two thousand dollars. I understand, but we we're going to be less than what it originally was by using some of the money that DOT is going to let us use to move the gopher tortoises. Yes, sir. It's not DOT. It's DEO. Move, it's actually the I'm funding agency. We move this item forward, Mr. Chairman. Second. Got a proper motion, and we got a proper second. And I'll just say that's what I understood um, from our Monday meeting with Mike Rodriguez was saying that. Actually, was going to reduce the, the amount, and uh, we could transfer those money. So, um, thank you for that clarification and that question, Commissioner Rawls. It's yeah, just uh, uh, observation. There's in, in the agreement it talks about twelve, um, mm -hmm. but it, it says twelve adult and twelve juvenile. Um, I didn't know if that needs to be clarified, but it, it looks to me like we're getting we're paying for twelve only, and I guess if there's any more, it, it's on a per turtle basis. If it's more there's than that. potential for there to be less. Oh yeah, it's less process, as well. Right. You're, you're aware of, you know, there's mm -hmm. the potential for more or less. But I just, I just, and I'm pulling up right now to reread it, but it, there's, you'll see where it says 12 and 12, and I didn't know if, if that was something that needed to be clarified in the contract, but it, I'm fine. Okay. All in favor, indicate saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mark. I just didn't know there was so much money in gopher turtles. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't well, it? Actually, that's not a bad price. I had to move some one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah, but I can handle 11 for 12 of them. Okay. What I'm saying, that's only part of it. We're, we're going we're gonna to take a three-minute break. You can make good money out of about five rents.
Commissioner's workshop. And uh, we'll move down to our last agenda item, uh, biweekly payroll. Um, the clerk's office provided a notification of their intent to go to biweekly payroll beginning for the pay period October 1st, 2023. Two. Two. Two? Okay. <laughs> 22. I guess that's still I'm right. the budget. That, yeah, yes, sir. New budget, but not a new year. That's okay? correct. Yeah. And on June 14th, 2022, staff brought this item to the workshop for further discussion on how we would implement this change. And we sent this back to um, staff to give us some options on how to try to navigate this uh, for the best uh, of our, for our employees. So Julianne, will you wanna go over the scenarios? We had three different scenarios that she'll present and then we'll open it up for discussion. And uh, Nat, that's when I'll do I'll have you come up for public comment during that rather than after this is done, okay? Okay. All right, Julianne? Yes, sir. Um, so when, the, when we met on June 14th, the board didn't have clear directions, so we have run a couple of different options. The um, schedule of how this will be implemented is September 30th will be the last weekly paycheck. Then October 7th will go, October 1 will be the official start date, so October 7th would be that first week with no paycheck. No, no tangible paycheck. And then October 14th would be the first bi-weekly paycheck. So that October 14th payment would be a double paycheck, but you would get nothing on the 7th. So obviously um, there will be a week where there is a burden on employees who have budgeted weekly expenses for weekly income. With that said, we've run two different scenarios. Scenario one would simply be one paycheck equal to each full-time employee's normal rate of pay minus insurance deduct deductions. So we, it wouldn't be insurance. Um, and then that would cost roughly 350 for across the board, all BOCC employees. The other scenario is just a one-time stipend of $400. Um, and that would be roughly 142, 915. These do not include our part-time or OPS employees, regardless of which scenario we run. The, the checks will still have to have deductions for taxes and FRS and all of those things. So it wouldn't be a gross $400, obviously. Um, it is my opinion, looking at trends in the county, the way we operate, that through departmental vacancies, we could cover uh, one week's paycheck without having an implication or a large implication to the overall fiscal year 23 budget. So we're, we're going to be, as Commissioner Pickens pointed out, in an advantage because we're gonna be week one of fiscal year 23. So we then have 52 weeks of potential departmental vacancies that would make up for those dollars, meaning there would be no bottom line hit and we would be able to sustain employees until they get that second paycheck, which is gonna have two weeks worth of pay. Um, the alternative, as requested by the board, was to look at options for loans to an employees. Um, I will tell you that loans get very, very complicated. Um, and if the board wants to go down the, the road of a loan, we would need much greater information. The board needs to decide whom is going to be eligible, what the amount of the loan is, what the repayment schedule is, ensuring that we still maintain the federal minimum wage standard so your loan repayment net 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 can't violate that employee's wage earnings federally um, there would have to be a tangible promissory note and the process for which we would collect on any promissory note that defaults either through termination separation or otherwise um, there also could potentially be tax implications depending on how we implement that loan to employees. So the, the loan process is brought to you because the board specifically asked for the questions, but it is not my recommendation that we travel that road due to the complexities that it brings about for both the board as well as the clerk's office. Um, with that, I'm here to answer questions in, in what's proposed to you and get a direction. Okay, yeah, I wasn't really, okay. Is that okay, commissioners? We'll hear from uh -huh. Nat, who's uh, the union representative. Uh, Nat, if you wanna come on up. How are y'all? Matt, you know the drill. If you would, state your name and address and yes, sir. position. Yes, 105 Shady Oak Lane uh, here in Palaka. 
uh, like to start this off by apologizing. I'm new to this role, and some of these questions may have been addressed at that initial uh, June 14th uh, meeting, but I wasn't privy to the spot that I am now. So as we move forward, uh, I just want you to understand that this isn't um, a finger-pointing session, but what we have is we have a lot of union members that have heard rumors of what could be the potential fallout from moving to a bi-weekly pay schedule. Um, and my role in this is one to get to um, what the end result will be as it reflects to our employees toward their pay, toward their, um, toward their benefits, and then as well um, give the opportunity to where they understand where this derived from. Uh, it's easy for me to sit back and research the abilities that the clerk of court may hold or that the county commission may hold, but uh, I'm not an educated man enough to relay that adequately to my crews. So I would appreciate if I could get some kind of a, a reference of, of where this derived, um, how it came about, what the benefits of it are for the county. And in the end, I would like to clear up some of the questions that I may have in regards to the uh, fallout for our employees um, because there are concerns. So everyone clear on that. I want to just make sure that we, we don't feel like I'm not coming aggressively toward anybody. I just, I got to get some answers to where I can relay this appropriately to my people. Um, so. First of all, uh, I heard um, in your statement, Ms. Young, where you're talking about on June 14th, the mm -hmm. uh, clerk of, how do you want to be addressed, Matt? Because I've always called you Matt. <laughs> my, name's, my name is Matt, and I tell everybody down at the office, uh, too, just call me Matt. Mr. Uh, Matt Reynolds. Well, this information to the board with the intent of moving toward a bi-weekly pay schedule. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that this clearly was a move by the clerk of courts, correct? That, that's, that's right, Matt. This actually started in, um, not it, it's this fiscal year that we're in right now it was the budget request for this fiscal year so it was june um june of 21 i guess would have been the letter that i originally sent to the board during that time and i stated then that the clerk's office would have if we were going to stay on weekly payroll for the board employees we needed an additional uh, payroll position I didn't ask for an additional payroll position at the time because I said, if we were to transition to biweekly payroll, I think I would be able to maintain at the same staffing level. Right. So that's initially where the request and kind of the, the path that we, start, myself and the board started down in June of, June of 21. Right, okay. That clears up that question for me. Now, in regards to the benefits of doing this, I've heard several things that it's gonna save the county money. Is the county money being saved based on that needed position? Mm -hmm. What would be paid out over years and years of that needed position? Correct. So that would be the, the monies that would be saved from it? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's right. Um, all right. So with this kind of a move, especially with fire rescue, with uh, neighboring departments, departments around the state, when they go to a biweekly schedule, there are plenty of our people that kind of that stands a hair up on their back of the neck due to 7K exemption, where... Right now, we obtain our overtime working here in this county as the fire professionals that work here. Um, after 53 hours, we get our, our overtime. Mm -hmm. With a lot of biweekly pay plans, you can hear that they're automatically tied to that 7K exemption type right. status, where then right. that changes your overtime accrual to anything over. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I know exactly what the you're talking about. Is, mm -hmm. What that means to us is, okay, if I'm getting paid on a two-week schedule and I have to call out sick because my kid has... COVID or whatever happens, that affects the overtime that I accrue through that two-week pay. So one call out in that two-week schedule wipes away all of my overtime, right? Which hurts our employees, right? Because in, in the situation we're in, we have a lot of employees that work overtime because we have many vacancies in our department. That's a way for these employees to generate some extra revenue during these times where inflation's at an insane high, right? So. For us, when we heard that two-week uh, bi-weekly pay schedule, it had a lot of red flags come up, and we wanted to make sure that um, through me coming up here and speaking mm -hmm. with you, that there was well understood that that would be a negotiable item through the union, that it wouldn't be able to be switched to a 7K exemption type status where our pay then moved, mm -hmm. um, which would affect our, our overtime rate and stuff like that without it being uh, a negotiable item. And I just wanted to make sure that I said that on the mic and that we had an understanding from the clerk and from everyone else involved that that's not the intent of what this move is for. Um, am, am I correct in saying that? You are correct. And, and we had talked about it. I don't know if we talked about it at the June meeting, um, but I'm pretty sure that I've referenced it in my letters to the board previously that it will just be a change in the frequency that you receive your pay. It won't be a change to your pay period right. because I don't have the authority to change you guys from a weekly pay period. 
because the board's pay period starts, I can't remember, Sunday at midnight or uh, 12.01 or whatever it is, and it ends the following, sat, you know, um, that's not changing. So it'll just be the frequency of what you would normally receive your weekly paycheck. You'll just receive it every other week. Right. Be, does that kind of make sense? It, that it, it does. And so that, that it doesn't affect up. your overtime and the overtime doesn't bleed from one week to another. I, I don't have the authority to change that. So it would, okay. what I was proposing to change is just the frequency at which you're paid, okay. not the periods that it's determined on. Understood. And so with that, just for clarification, uh, this, what happened was when I, when I was told of this meeting, I sent out a list of my people, hey, I need every question you got. I don't want anyone to be sitting back going, wait a minute, what about this? When this is all said and done, I want the opportunity to address these things to put these people's mind at ease. One of the concerns is um, how, we're, how we're taxed upon our overtime, right? So hurricane comes through and we have to work seven days straight. Mm -hmm. That's an insane amount of hours that you work in a week yep. and there's a lot of overtime that's built into that week. Well, when that happens and that check hits the bank, we see our tax rate on that check. There's a substantial amount more taken out of that paycheck than if we would have just worked a 48 hour week. So a lot of our employees have concerns that when you take and you combine a biweekly pay period, um, that now all of a sudden when you were going to be getting paid $900 this week and $1,100 the next week, mm -hmm. there's taxation on that $900, which reflects on this much. And then there's tax on that $1,100, which reflects on this much. If you were to add them together, mm -hmm. it's a wash and you're fine. Right. But if you take that, whatever 900 and 1100 and you combine it and you're taxed on that $2,000 amount, we saw a different tax rate. I don't Am I making myself clear with that? Yep. I hope and I'm it speaking. can happen. Uh, yeah. I'll let Susan. That, that's a major concern with, with some of our people. Okay, so the IRS tables are based on annual salaries. So, like, if you get paid $500 a week and then it takes the taxes out, the tables take your $500 times 52 weeks and it plugs that into the IRS table based on how you've set up your W-4, you know, your exemptions, married, all of that. And it says this is how much your annual salary would be, so this is how much your taxes would be, and it pulls it out accordingly. So now with the frequency of pay being biweekly, it's gonna do the exact same thing. It's gonna take that biweekly amount times 26, so it's gonna annualize it, so the rate will be the same. I mean, yes, your taxes will be higher, but the rate will be the same. Okay, the only time that that would affect you is like, we see it when people like um, leave and they get a large payout for a vacation or something. Um, the IRS tables assume that you're making that all year long, so it will bump up the rate in those situations. Right. Okay. Does that help? It does, yes. I hope that clears it up. Um, one of the other concerns that I heard um, as far as when the timeline of this would start, and this is where it can get complicated, and I hope I can relay this adequately to you. So we work on the 2448 schedule, meaning mm -hmm. um, because I'm on C shift, I may work uh, Monday, Thursday. So I'm paid for 48 hours that week. Well, then that next week I work Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday. So then I'm paid for 72 hours that week. So when this transition takes place, there is a very well likelihood that we're going to have employees that are sitting on their two short weeks worth of pay, right? Monday, Thursday, and then the week before that would have been Tuesday, Friday, how it all lays out. Um, those two weeks they're paid on their shorts, and then that next week would have been when they counted for their long week, their month, Sunday, yep. Wednesday, Saturday. Yep. Did I say that too quick? You follow me on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the concern is that as this takes place, there are going to be crews for us that have sat on that two week short pay, knowing that October 7th was going to be their long week. Okay. So if the board does decide, whatever that would be option A to, to do the paycheck or whatnot, I would urge that that would be a consideration in doing this mathematical equation, however you got to figure out, to where that, that crews that would be in that pay scale for that time frame would receive the rate that they would receive, or else that's a hit to them. They count on that, um, especially incomes that are single incomes. There isn't someone else that's bringing in the money and they're expecting that long week paycheck based on how they budget through the, through the month. And that sound fair, clear with how I, I stated that? Um, one of the other items, and I just want to clear this up real quick, um, is how that would work. Hey, I'm sorry, sir. Before you go forward, I, I'm a little confused, and I want to make sure if I'm confused, you probably are too. You're a lot smarter sure. than I yeah. am, but can we do what he's saying? Yeah. So I, I think what he's trying to say is, um, for example, when you look at a lot of the fire EMS people and you look at what they make annually, uh, it's, it's one amount. But when you look at what they're making 
um, week to week, and it depends on the 7K exemption whether they they are whether they start getting overtime over 40 or over 53, um, because that's where the majority of the pay comes from. And I think what Nat is trying to say is, if the board decides to do option number one, which is a, a one-time le- weekly thing, um, average the the fire EMS's uh, uh, staff's pay so that they're not paid that on that one week on their smaller week, not right. So just average of pay and not just an a, right an average amount of pay that, not a that can be done not an issue right I, yeah I don't that would, it would just be have an to be average amount of base wages of base so it, right, right it of would base not wages. be if if you if you're somebody who always It'll clocks free overtime money, Julianne, sir still be free money yeah <laughs> but that would be an average of the long week and the short week. It's, it's over, actually going to be an average of their annual, the annual base wages. Yeah, of their so it, annual base it's wages, not going to yeah. be, and so it may very well fall in somewhere in between their short, short week, week and their long, long week. week. But again, this then that next week they would get a long week and a long week, or a long week and a short week. So uh, does that you follow what I'm saying? Um, so it would ultimately then carry everybody in theory through to the next time when they're going to get a double paycheck for all of those hours including right. overtime hours right. of that long week and short week okay everybody it's clears mud on there I, I just wanted to make sure we understand that it's, it's a it's a stipend they would still get their regular check the next week i understand Correct. no i understand, I understand that the following and for yeah. Hey, for those that budget and that have a little bit of coin sitting in their pocket, that's okay. Mm-hmm. But we may very well have employees that are living dollar to dollar. And when that, when that October 7th paycheck um, comes in, at, as you said, it might be between that high paycheck they're used to getting and that low paycheck they're used to getting. That may very well be what they have budgeted to make their house payment, mm-hmm. buy gas, groceries, whatever. I don't get to dictate that. Mm-hmm. So the concern for the union, obviously, is that that could affect their wage. Now, I understand, based on how the board's going to vote, that there's going to be something that comes in a way of, of helping them out in that regards. But up until this point, the, there hasn't been any decided on that, and that was a question that was raised. And so that's why I'm bringing it to the board's attention and just asking for your whatever, your input on that, whatever you can look at, how you work out the pay, how you work out what it's going to do, that that consideration would be brought in, that our employees are set up on a shift-type schedule where they're not paid the same thing every week. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it may fall that October seventh hit may fall at a time that it doesn't reflect what they would normally get which is how they budget and pay their bills Um, so that was the only reason i wanted to bring that up um one other concern and this might just be overthinking it is our our benefits like there are plenty of five week months where you don't pay insurance you don't because of the way it all schedules out how does that work when you transition to a bi-weekly and and susan can explain it because the clerk's office has been on bi-weekly for several years so it would operate the same way so like right now when you get that fifth week there's no deductions for the insurances so instead it'll be the third week so there's two months out of the year that there's three paychecks so on that third week there would be no benefits taken out gotcha okay so that's still reflected and that wouldn't be a loss um let me just look at my notes because i'm all over the place and i apologize uh i believe i've covered everything Um, As far as concerns, obviously there's a concern when we have a department that has run on weekly paychecks since I'm 22 years here, 23, counting my part-time, it's always been weekly. It's what you grow accustomed to. Um, So there's going to be some heartache from folks that maybe not budget well enough to accommodate for a bi-weekly pay, and I get that. Um, Am I clear in understanding that this is going to happen? There's, There's not an avenue that we could wave a red flag or say hey wait a minute this is affecting us negatively this this is happening am i correct in saying it, that it is my plan to go to that un- unless the board does allocate me additional resources for uh for an additional position so Understood. yeah at this point it's yeah that's Understood. we're moving forward uh okay well with that being said is there any questions for me that i haven't i haven't hit on um and anything i need to clear up in what i said okay we're going to start um in order with commissioner harvey first thank you Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nat, I don't have many questions for you. I think anything we can do to protect the union, mm-hmm. I think that's what we need to do. And and I think that y'all can figure that out with our administration. Uh, if we go that route today, um, I think that y'all can find out how many shifts are in that cycle and what's going to take place there and address that through the union. I can't imagine that we're not going to be receptive to that. Uh, this commissioner so. would be. so. Um, Fire rescue is very important to me, as you well know, and has been my whole career here. 
So I'm good with that part. Uh, and I believe we're going to take care of that. I just have, I want to ask a question here. And this isn't for you as much as Matt, mm -hmm. um, the Honorable Matt Reynolds, I'll say that. Okay. September, we're going to have five paychecks, correct? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So they're going to get an extra paycheck. The employees will at the end of the month in September. Mm -hmm. And then October 7th, they're going to get an extra, they're going to get the, if we went with scenario one, mm -hmm. they'll get another check on the 7th. Yes, sir. So basically mm -hmm. weekly, weekly. Mm -hmm. And then on the 14th, they're going to get a biweekly check, mm -hmm. but then they'll have to skip the 21st and go to the 28th before they get their another next Another biweekly check. check. Mm -hmm. So they'll actually get f another five paychecks. Another week, yeah. In, in that. October. Mm -hmm. They'll get five in September mm -hmm. and five, if you looked at the weekly. You know uh, under option one, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yep. so it's really not, it shouldn't hurt them too bad. I know it's going to be an adjustment, and and believe me, I was I took a job one time where I got paid monthly, and I told mm -hmm. my wife I don't know what we how we're going to pay our bills, but once we got the monthly check, we were able to pay everything at one time, and um, I talked to a young lady at a uh, building today, and she had some concerns, but then she said, well, my husband's pay weekly, so I'll be able to pay my bills a little bit ahead maybe, so I think it's mm -hmm. going to work out very well. I'm going to be honest with you, this commissioner <coughs> likes. Scenario one, I think it takes care of our employees the way we should take care of our employees. I think we can take care of the unions. There's more than just, I think you've got a funky pay period. I get that, but we can handle that problem. And as long as we're not hurting or any unintended consequences, this commissioner is all for option one. And I believe that's gonna protect our employees and do the right thing for our employees in the long run. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Harvey, Commissioner Rawls. <clears throat> Under Chapter 447.209, that's your management rights for your you know, county government. County does not have the right to impose this on you, so you have the right to demand impact bargaining, and I would, if I was in your position, get that started as soon as possible. Um, I feel like you guys are a little bit behind the eight ball in that regard. You should have already requested impact bargaining. You know this is coming up, but um, I, I, I don't think that this is going to be anything dire for anybody. I think it's going to require people to make changes psychologically to how they um, budget their own, their private money. Um, I don't think by adding that in. Uh, I honestly was, was under the impression that everybody was going to um, the seven, 7K exemption. Um, how many people are not under 7K do you think in your entire organization? Um, I'm not sure I understand enough about the 7K exemption to the, answer that, the 50, I know the we 53. are paid in overtime after 53. Okay. Based on the fire side, when you when you are dual certified, you get paid after that 53 hour, and we still have plenty of single cert paramedics that are paid overtime after 40. After 40. So I think so that we're, that's going to split it. That's going to be the conversation you guys have to have as a bargaining unit. You're going to sit down with your with your group, come up come up with a uh, a, a majority answer, and then negotiate. Um, with, with uh, administration, the same thing with the other collective bargaining units that we have in the county. Um, it, it's it's your right, yeah. and, uh, and like I said, if I was you, I would I would be all over it. Um, you, you you brought up a lot of really 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 good questions, um, things that I would have never thought of. And I've been when I wore a uniform, I was paid weekly, so never had to never had to worry about that. Um, I, I was going through some scenarios in my mind, and at the end of the day, like Ms. Frank said, the number is going to be the same. You'll make the exact same amount of money. Um, I understand some of the concern regarding the overtime. Um, you know, it, it, that's kind of a double-edged sword for me because we shouldn't have to be paying all that overtime if we were paying you guys enough to keep you around and not having people, you know, start and quit and start and quit so often. We wouldn't be having the, these concerns at that point. So I think that's a whole other conversation that needs to be had. But it it should not be germane to the conversation to moving us into that um, uh, uh, bi-weekly pay or bi-monthly bi pay rather. Um, is it bi monthly or bi-weekly? Bi-weekly, bi okay. Bi so by, you know, you're gonna get, get paid 26 times a year instead of 52 times a year. And um, you know, go in there and negotiate, get, negotiate that impact. And you know, I'll, uh, I, I would, would stand in total support of what the uh, collective bargaining agreement um, for each group uh, brings forward. Um, I, you know, I, I've, I've worked um, being paid twice a month when I was in the military, it was like that. It, 
You know, we I remember sticking money in an envelope and writing week one, week two, and old school budgeting, <laughs> um, paying rent, paying electricity. Uh, so I, I I know it. I know exactly what you're talking about, and it could be detrimental to people, especially if they get that that wad of cash up front and they don't think about my next check is not for two weeks, right. Right. and they blow it. That really could create heartache. So um, I can't stress enough. I think that the department heads need to go back and and uh, make sure that that um, all the folks that they're working with are. are educating what's fixing to happen and help them along as much as they can. I mean, we're, um, I, I, I agree with Commissioner Harvey. I'm, I'm in favor of option one. Um, while I, I don't think that everybody needs it, I think it's the fairest thing to do. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it wouldn't be right for us to sit there and just make an assumption because someone makes $75,000 a year that they don't have $76,000 a year worth of bills. Um, that's always a possibility. So <laughs> it, it, it would be, it would be very disrespectful to, to go down that road. But, um, you know, I, 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 would, uh, I would love to continue this conversation, but I think that the bargaining unit needs to speak first. All right. And I, I mean, I got to be careful what I say because we are in negotiations now. Um, I think I can relay to, to this board and to our, to our management that's been sitting here. I've worked here since I was 19 years old. I stepped in the door as a young man making $7 an hour and got my eyes opened up to what a 2448 schedule is all about. And looking at where we're at now, compared to where we've walked through. As an older guy in this department, I can stand back and applaud you guys and thank you for where you've brought us to where we're at now. Um, I, can, I can say the same thing for our county administrator and my chief and my director back there. I am able to sit back and feel great about where this county is. That doesn't say that we don't have leaps and bounds that we need to get to, to mm -hmm. where we can keep employees and mm -hmm. where we can keep the, the bleed from happening in Putnam County. And we all understand that. Yeah. Past that, I probably can't say too much. Mm -hmm. But I wanna make sure that you understand I'm appreciative of where we're at and I'm appreciative for your sentiment as far as option one and the fact that this board has wanted to take care of our employees. We see that. Um, I see that as a union. Our department sees that as the people that are here and we know as far as Putnam County can do, Putnam County is going to do for us and we appreciate that. Um, we appreciate the efforts that are taken uh, through the negotiation process that we're going to get the best that we can get for our people. Um, so and we're appreciative and I, I, and I thank you for your time. Today. And just before, before I finish, just so you'll know, this commissioner also understands what it's like to wear the uniform what it's like to, to be in the position to have new people coming in, having to train them. As a taxpayer, I also know how much money is flying out the door. We could, we could grab that money and reinvest it back in the department. And I think that's where, where we as a, as a commission um, need, need to get on the same sheet of music. We and, need to keep and, and you said stop the bleed. You're right. It, that bleed is, is dollars dropping out of a bucket going to all these surrounding counties taking advantage of us being the training ground. So I'm with you, brother. Okay, Commissioner Adams, Act. <clears throat> Matt, what's the cost of the, I thought there was another cost besides just the employee. I thought there was a administrative type through the year. I thought there were some other fees or checks written. A little bit with the checks in the bank, no. yes. Yeah, what, right. It, it's minimal though? Not, yeah, nominal. What, I would say that would be nominal. What's the cost of your employee if you had to hire the other uh, I mean, it, it's somebody with, with um, relevant expertise in payroll and whatnot, that's uh, with benefits 80 plus, 85? Yeah, at least 75, somewhere between 75 and 80 with benefits. and. I thought you were asking for 92 with everything back. When you that, that that might have been true, yes, sir. Um, I couldn't remember off the top of my head. But and now it's 75, so yeah. obviously 60. it's going to change. Um, that uh, the cost of maintaining that person is is mm -hmm. going to be an ever changing. It, it is going to well. be yeah, continually increasing each year, and that's why I had initially come in with with a recommendation that here's a way that we can continue operating without having to add any cost. With, with option one, it would take four years to recoup that four and a half years. Payback. To pay back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That position. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems like a lot of years. I'm all right with option one. I, and and, and the, my reason has nothing to do with, with that. I actually think it would be smarter to just hire the other employee. But uh, I don't think we did. I'm not going to say that. <clears throat> I think we... This is the best way that we can do something really good for the employees and do something for the long-term benefit of the county through the clerk's office. I think this is a double win for both all the employees if we do option one, as well as the clerk's office being able to do that in long-term when we hit that mm -hmm. four and a half, five year mark, that we'll see a cost savings at that point. Mm -hmm. Especially since, like we all said, that position you know, was 60 grand, literally like 
nine months ago or whenever we first talked about this, now it's 75, you know, maybe it's a $110,000 position and by the time we get to that five year mark, I don't know. Um, I'm for option one as well, um, just because I think it's a way to, to help our employees in this time that I think we're in a recession. We have some other inflation like you mentioned and uh, long term, I think it does help the county. Um, I was leaning towards just giving you a person, but uh, long term, <laughs> I think it does benefit us. So thank you. Okay, Commissioner Turner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I totally agree with everything that's been set up here today. Uh, the main thing is, is that we do keep the union happy on this issue and that all our employees are happy. But I'm hoping that they'll also understand while we're going through this is that when Matt basically told us we're, we're going to, and he, the call here is he is. Mm -hmm. We can give him another person. He's willing to stay on one week, but the call is really his. And so what the commission tried to do was try to make it the changeover as best that we possibly could for our employees with the very least pain for the people that live week to week and that pay certain things every week of the month and if they miss a check, then they're in trouble. Um, that's why we asked staff to come up with an option that we could actually give them a check on their off week while they're waiting on their first two week check. And then their first two week check would then cover the following two weeks until they got another one, but they would have two weeks of money. Yes, it'll take a little effort to not spend it all on candy and ice cream, right. you know, <laughs> instead of groceries to get through the two weeks. But still, you know, that, I'm hoping that the department heads and what have you can help with that. I really do. I hope they can help with that. But this, there's nothing sinister here going on. What we're trying to do by giving an extra stipend, basically giving an extra check, is that to make sure that our employees don't hurt any more than absolutely possible to get us where we want to get. And I agree. commissioners, I believe that through vacancies, we'll pay for this oh, and yeah. never yeah, see right. it on our bottom <coughs> line. I truly believe that to be the case. In the last several historical years, we've, we've been able to do, we would have been able to do this easily, especially in today's labor market. So mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I move that we move this, this uh, item forward. We've got a proper motion by second. Commissioner Turner, proper, um, second by Commissioner Harvey before I go to him. I'm going to. Um, and I agree with, with all the commissioners. We want to make this as painless as possible. Uh, it will continue to save money, especially after the fourth year, if you just figure it's $60,000 or $75,000. And um, so I think this is, um, is the way to go. We're not, we don't want to put any hardship on anybody. Uh, so, and we'd appreciate what everybody does um, uh, for the county and our county employees, whether on the firefighter side, the EMC, EMT sign, EMS, public works, whatever. Um, they're our most valuable asset is our employees. Mm -hmm. Harder to keep. Um, it's just, um, but what we talked about a little bit um, today is it's not all about money. It's about working conditions and a career path and those type things. Uh, but y'all are our in, most important asset in this county is our employees here. Can't operate without them at, at whatever level. Mm -hmm. and, and this commissioner priest, I believe everybody up here does. Each, each one of these commissioners. So. And um, so anyway, with that, any more comment on this item? I just, excuse me, Commissioner I Rawls. I just want to say, I, I, I hope Commissioner Turner is wrong. I hope we, we can't fund this thing through savings and <laughs> vacancies. I hope that we are able to fill every vacant position, fill every vacant position and um, not have to work our employees the way we do. You know, I was talking uh, with one department head and he was saying how people are having to come in on the weekends and help and work to help keep things pulled together. but. Uh, I personally um, enjoy my family time, and I hope you guys are able to do the same thing. And, you know, a, a, a career in the fire service especially, giving up one-third of your life to protect the county, that's a lot of, that's a big ask. Giving up half of your life away from your family is stressful on the family. Um, okay. So uh, appreciate what you guys do. you got work to do on your end on the bargaining unit. That's why you guys are a collective bargaining unit. Okay. But um, I, th I think this is going to be a win-win for everybody. Okay, we've got a proper motion, proper second. All in favor, and it goes saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Go ahead and move, 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 public comment. 
um, up now. So any individual who makes pub public comment. Um, this portion of the uh, agenda is designed to allow citizens an opportunity to bring matters to the attention of the board. It's not reasonable to expect that the board will engage in debate or deliberation on matters which the board received no prior information. So we'll limit to three minutes. Um, so our first speaker is Catherine Blair and Don Murray. Marie, okay. If you would um, state your name, both your names and addresses for the record and speak clearly into the microphone. Um, my name is Catherine Blair. I'm in uh, East Palaka, 109 North Geraldo, and this is... My name is Dawn Murray, and I'm at 108 South Geraldo in East Palaka. Right, we live in the Port Buena Vista neighborhood, um, and I have been in contact um, over the past six months with Mike Troskel, Sean Ladd, Jeff Rawls, and Terry Suggs regarding our water which is a county owned well um, that is, it's, you guys take care of it. The county takes care of it, they service it. This is our water that comes out of our pipes, that comes out of our sinks. Our children bathe in it. Our children are forced to brush their teeth with it. This is what they have to live with. Every day we don't get, we don't get clear water. This is it. We have to either buy bottled water to drink or we have to drink this. And there's plenty of people in our neighborhood that are forced to drink this. Majority of the people in our neighborhood are the elderly and cannot, and very fixed income, and they cannot afford to buy bottles and bottles of water. My neighbor, who is an elderly woman, I had a conversation with her yesterday, drinks this water every day. We wash our face with it. Again, my children, I had to run my son a bath the other day, and it was darker than this. It was brown. And we dumped it out, and I gave him a shower. It's the same water, but at least we don't have to visually watch our child play in this water. This water has, <clears throat> excuse me, um, double the federal legal FDA limit of HHA5 TTHMS, or TTHM double the federal legal limit. So not only is it unhealthy for our children to drink, it's illegal. It's a liability for the county. Our, my daughter, her, she got diagnosed with a spindle cell cancer back in, um, back in March. She had surgery to remove it. And this water causes cancer and neurological disease. Again, people are drinking this every day. My daughter doesn't drink this water. She's still got cancer. And I have been in contact now with the county um, March 26th, or with the commissioners, I'm sorry, the commissioners I mentioned earlier, March 26th, April 9th, April 15th, May 3rd, May 27th, and again today, August 9th, which I was told by Jeff Rawls that there's a meeting today, and I was just got out of the shower, I saw that I ran up here. I'm like, okay, I'm going, because this is enough. She's my, my friend Don here, my neighbor. 19 years, 19 years, I've been, drinking that water. And when I had my kid in 2009 is when I finally wised up and said, I probably should not be drinking this if I want to be there for my son when he's older. The people in the, um, in the neighborhood have um, complained to the, to the water department a lot. Their solution is to just flush the pipes, flush the pipes. And obviously, this is the water that comes out of the pipe that they flush, and it's actually worse after they flush it, honestly. I don't know if it stirs something up. I, th I don't know if the pump is going bad and this is sediment coming from the bottom of the pump, if it's the holding tank that it's coming out of. I don't know, but it's, it's, it's not getting better. Whatever solution you guys have been doing since I've been in contact with you guys since March 26th, it has not gotten better. And has there been anything done since March 26th since I contacted and spoke to four different com uh, commissioners. Our water bills went up. Oh, our water bill went up. Yes, we pay $78 a month for this water. $1,000 a year comes out of our pockets for this. Would you guys be willing to drink this? No. We will pour you a glass. We'll pour you a glass. If you guys aren't willing to drink this, we should not be, we should not have to. We should not have to bathe our children I'll in this. Don't drink out of the if he'll take a sip of that. All you I'd rather drink out of the Okawaha <laughs> than that. All you have to smell it. Open it up and smell it. It will burn your nose. I was sitting there. I took a whiff of it because I actually haven't, you know, other than showering and whatnot. It's, 
more spring. But um, this, I, we, we poured this in here when we left and when we left to come out here and it burns because it's been sitting in the bottle and it's been like <clears throat> fermenting for the past two hours. Okay. So, I mean, um, something needs to be done. Have a few questions. Um, Commissioner Rawls? So, the original email, and I'm assuming it came from you, mm -hmm. um, I was actually on my way to a wedding on a Saturday, and I forwarded the email to Mike Troxell, who was then the head of Public Works, and Terry Suggs, and I said, um, this looks urgent. Um, we then had uh, a meeting where um, Sam Willis and Mike Troxell came in. There was a lot of back and forth communication between the, the, uh, the, com the commissioners and um, Troxell and um, Sam Willis. What I gathered was that your development was originally designed to be like 250 homes, but there's only 50 homes, but the, the system we're looking to install for whatever reason is too, big enough for 250 homes. Then my question is why don't we just go to a small RO system and be done with it? Um, but that didn't go anywhere. So um, I'm in favor of taking action immediately, um, but I'm only one commissioner, and that's the reason why when you sent the email today, I said there's a meeting today, mm -hmm. Convince two more of these guys to take action. It's a done deal. Um, you're right. Five months um, that we've had to, to make that go away. And there's a lot of options out there that could be done off the shelf real, um, real quickly. Not spend a, almost a half a million dollars, by the way. And that's what we're looking at spending. $400,000 on that place. Um, it's, it's, it's a big bitter pill for me to swallow for 50 residents. Not that y'all are important. But that's a lot of money that can be going to another part of Putnam County and, and spending a whole lot less money to get you the <laughs> clean water that you deserve, especially paying 80 bucks a month. That's just the state. $80 for. a month for this. I mean, just imagine right now your grandchildren. This is what your grandchildren's yeah. bathing in and drinking and washing I would, their I, face I personally in. would highly encourage you to put a filter head of that on your house. And, and, we and, do. And, yep, okay. I absolutely do. I actually have a filter head on both of my showers. Um, it still comes out. It, it, Filters out a majority. Maybe, I'm saying I say filter, a whole house filter ahead of your, your water. I but. do have a whole house filter, <clears throat> and on top of this $1,000 a year to pay y'all guys for right. water, we also pay $1,000 a year just in filters that are supposed to last three months, will only last one month. So if you need pictures, I can send you a picture the, the, of my we're, filter. We're, what I'm being told is and, the, the And that works great for people like me who are blessed to be able to afford that. My neighbor can't afford it. Right. And all the elderly and the, the fixed income and the low income families in my family cannot afford to put a $1,000 filter filtration system on their house. And then on, on top of that, pay $60 a month for filters. Because her filter, I've seen her filter, and it lasts maybe about a month. And it is, it's like clay when well, you she get a opens lot of solids it in, in your, your water, it's obvious. It's, you yeah. can look at it. Yeah, you can see it. it if that sat there for a month, would that settle? In no. To, yes, no? it will settle. It will settle, it yeah. It in an hour. Okay. An hour, and it's so it's very, and you get a lot of heavy solids. of this water in sediment. That's not good. So the, the, what you're seeing, and I'm not trying to make excuses, apparently it's fairly typical for a system that uses chlorine to sanitize the water and then... The byproduct from what we're using <clears throat> as a sanitizer yields these results. Why they're so high, I, I cannot speak to that. I'm completely out of school when it comes to that. To out. But y'all guys have to put so much chemicals in our water that it is three times right, I, I agree. over the limit <clears throat> in causing cancer right. and neurological I, disorders. Mr. Choxa was let go. Mr. Suggs took over Public Works. Now you've got um, a couple of new guys running it apparently. So. You know, I don't know where we're at in flux with this. Who's running? Who's doing what? Um, I, I can't give you an answer today. Okay, Commissioner Harvey. Well, number one, Mr. Troxel resigned. He wasn't let go. <laughs> Whatever. Um, and I apologize. First, I've heard about it. You haven't contacted me, but that's okay. We've been but contacting I, I, our water department. I get it. I get it. I Mike, can I? I want to talk to our public works director for for just a moment. Mike, can you come up here, please? Yeah, Would I you? understand there's a problem, but now we need solutions. That's right. So we got a we got a problem here, Mike. So what is the solution going forward to solve? I don't want people drinking that water. So how can we? We're, we had a fix on it the other day, correct? So explain what's going on with this water. Well, there are multiple uh, options available uh, that we are researching to bring back for workshop. Um, one of them would be to run a 16-inch line from the fire station out as far as we can 
then run an eight inch line to Port Point of Vista. And Mr. Another. Troxell and I talked about running that line out there before his resident, before he resigned. Yeah. Another, another option would be to run an eight inch line from the fire station all the way out. That might reduce the cost of that particular approach. Another approach is to retrofit the existing plant. We're researching that further. Uh, another option would be to uh, sell the utilities plant and hand it over to a uh, company that would retrofit or take whatever measures are necessary to get the water uh, to the standard it needs to be. So those are four options. We when are, Mr. Trox and I were looking at running the pipe out there, um, it would serve other people along that route. And that made sense to me, but um, I apologize that I didn't hear from you. I didn't, I have worked on this for months ago, but I didn't know you, I didn't know you and I didn't know the bottle of water, okay? So we did talk about running those lines, but it was, it was quite expensive. It was a couple of million three dollars. Three-quarter million, I think, right. from the 16-inch to the 18-inch uh, reduced line out there. Uh, and we're looking at the 8-inch. We, we think that will be significantly uh, less. Yeah, but 8-inch, from my understanding, wouldn't take care it would of future just, development. It would be just, just Port Buena Vista. That's all So it why would we not just go with a larger pipe? And we, we are researching multiple options that are cost-effective, potentially cost-effective, to bring back to the board for discussion and feasibility discussions. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Turner. It seems to me like the last time we discussed this issue, we had asked uh, Public Works to reach out and see if there was a private firm That's that right. would take over this system that we didn't have to put money in that would give them good water without us putting 300 or 400,000 taxpayer dollars into this system or a million dollars to run the, to, to run the pipe mm -hmm. out to be in a vista. The county didn't put this water system in. The county acquired the water system that they, we had to take had it to take over it. by default. That's so right. by default. So I'm into doing everything I can to make this work, but we need to do it the best way we can for the citizens of Putnam County along with you. I'm hoping, we talked about this last week, Buena Vista, when we were over in East Clock in that meeting. So where do you think we might be as far as, Terry, do you know, or are you involved in this, or is, it, is JR involved in it? Who is involved in actually trying to see where we are in the process to see if somebody will take this plant over and turn it back private again. We've had, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've had Public Works reaching out and, and seeing what we can come up with as far as maybe some potential folks in the, uh, in the water business. Uh, we've also, uh, based on the last direction, researching where we might be able to possibly reach out for some folks to take it over by purchasing it. Uh, so we're looking at both of those options, and I believe Mr. Nimitz and them are coming up with some other options as far as infrastructure and getting new service out there as well. well. Obviously, the best way to go would be to run water out there because then we'd have future infrastructure in the area. But, and, but, but uh, not so obvious, but crystal clear to me is we don't have a million dollars to run that pipe out there. You don't, we don't have it. So what we need to do is figure out a way to get them water, good water in the area as quickly as possible for the least amount of money, but quickly as possible and get them water. It's not completely about the money, but it has to be considered along with it. Absolutely, and that's exactly uh, what we're doing. As you know, earlier this morning, I, I've reached, I, uh, had uh, Mr. Nimitz reach out to uh, Mr. Willis about an update on this. I'll try to get an update to the board as, as soon as we can. I also understand that Mr. Rodriguez is sending information in as well. We'll look at that. And, uh, but you're absolutely right. These ladies are right. They deserve better than what they have. But it was a situation that the county kind of got dropped on and now we're responsible for it. But we'll do everything we can as expeditiously as we can to, to, this to resolve this issue. Even though they've been dealing with Mr. Rawls, this is my district. Thank you, Mr. Rawls, for doing that. I, I, I believe they went to everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I it went to I, just the, I, just I, the I couple I don't believe I ever saw that I mentioned. It, doesn't really matter, but this is my district, and it's not an issue. Oh, I, I, no, I spoke to you at the uh, county fair. Okay, let him, let him, yeah. not let him this, finish. Not only is this my district, I've also Sorry. <laughs> looking at the East Palaka utility system and those things like that. So I would like an update on this, not at the next board meeting. I'd like one by Friday of this week on where we are, what the plan is, how we're going to move this forward? Are we going to try to take it private, or is that a real issue, or do we need to put in some kind of an RO system like Commissioner Rawls was talking about? I like that idea. Get this done. I mean, I know there's I, a bunch of options here. You, a lot of times I, when the government hits options, they bog down 
into endless red tape. I'd like to, to uh, try to get around that bogged down red tape and try to get something done here. So uh, I didn't realize it was that bad. I appreciate you guys coming here today and showing me. And the, and, and the, you know, the, the visual is pretty email, cool. We spent five minutes getting ready. We and filled that, that up. Is filling up that water bottle. And with all due respect, as far as selling it off, I don't know, that kind of, in, in my mind, that makes me kind of feel like it's um, just brushing it off to make somebody else's problem and not actually fix, fixing the situation. If we sell off, if, if we sell the land to another, if you guys sell the land to another, that option, the, the water plant to another company, instead of fixing it before selling the, the, the water plant to another company, that feels more like it's just being brushed off to somebody oh, it's somebody else's problem now and hopefully they do it right. We didn't build it in the first place. I know, but now it is the county, regardless who like built it. Saying, Here, horse, well, I mean, but this but this isn't a horse. This is my children's health. Another complaint is this is our only tap water. I, get it. I don't want this you to is, have it. I want you to have This is our water. only option for what comes out of our house. Yep. I, stand here I mean, if I could spend five thousand dollars to do my own well, I would fully do that. And also, again, with all due respect, I just watched today almost three hundred thousand dollars went to go for tortoises in an AC unit and baseball fields. And we're, we're sitting here pulling, pulling strings in order just to fix my water that my children bathe in and drink and brush their teeth in. Yes. I see a problem with that. That's, okay. that's more priority. We also do. So, Mike, you got their contact information. Yes. And let's, like Commissioner Turner said, let's move this fast as possible and get them some relief as soon as we can. And, and thank you for coming today. Thank you. If I, if I could Mr. Rawlinson, we, um, we only got about another. Time. How long? How long? Got about another this? ten minutes in this building, right? Then, it, then yeah, everything's we're shutting. Out of power. Then we're gonna run out of power. Um, how how long? How long have we owned this water system? Is there any recourse on the previous owners? No, we got it. They abandoned it. They abandoned it. Okay. We had no. And there's no HOA that's responsible. No. No. So it's our responsibility. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Any other further public comment? Miscellaneous further comment. Could we close that public comment uh, <coughs> portion? We'll move down to Commissioner comments. Start with Commissioner Rawls. I have nothing else. Commissioner Harvey. No. Other than, other than I appreciate y'all bringing that to us, and <coughs> and honestly, I wish I'd have known it, but some of us, well, I didn't get an email, um, but we're going to find a solution. Thank you. Commissioner Adams Act. Our next meeting is the, the primary day. I don't know if we want to think about changing that day to accommodate two people that are running for re-election. I don't know if that's normal or not, but um, I know if I was in both of their shoes, I'd want to be waving signs or something instead of sitting in this room, but. I'd rather work for the taxpayer. Okay. I know we're going to try to keep the agendas as short as possible, other than stuff that has to be moved forward. We discussed that, correct? Uh, y yes, sir, to be the items that are, are necessary to come in front of the board for any type of uh, decision okay. making. And then also the workshop, because I plan on being at the canvassing board at 1.30. I don't know if I can change it to 2.30. I will, I'm going to leave here and go over and talk to them about that. But I need to be that because I need to be here for that 1.30 and then at 6 also. So, so Mr. Turner may have to, we'll have to run the... Um, the transportation workshop, which I think he's totally capable of doing. Well, let's be sure and pass something that Mr. Pickens doesn't want. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> District 5. <laughs> Get all the equipment out of District 1. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Turner, do you have any I have comments? No okay, I have no answer. comments. Is it okay if we continue the meeting? Is that up the meeting? We'll stay that date, Mr. Rawls and Commissioner? I'm fine. You're fine. Yeah. Okay, all right, but appreciate you bringing that out. Um, Commissioner Adams Act. Um, county Attorney? Nothing, thank you. Okay, uh, County Administrator? I have nothing new, thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can I make one quick comment before the power goes out? Yes. If we find a solution to this thing at Buena Vista, do I have to come back in two weeks or can the, can the uh, Administrator, as long as it's within his range, spend the money or the range that 
that you know can we just go on and do that or does everybody want to talk about it in two weeks before we go on and give these people some water? Range, we send to, it's send out the race in length, but, um, i understand but what we discussed never seemed to have moved forward from where we are right now i can <coughs> assure you we're fixing to move forward i'm fixing to assure you we're fixing to move forward and at least find out some information, but if we can find out a filter or something that we can put on there and get this water clean while we're going through the other motions, there I'd, like the, I'd like the authority yeah. from the board to go on and I put that, that thing on. If you can put something, you're talking about a temporary thing until we get the final. Season. Yeah, some kind yeah. of. Yeah. Rob's never going to run a pipe for yeah. three no, miles. No, 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 I ain't going to build no. If I can add a filter, put a small RO on it, do something. Do something to get this done. Well, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I think we, filters we, and RO would yeah. probably work too. I mean, I just don't know that. Okay, so we agree, we're waiving support yeah. if it's in the preview of the dollars yeah. of the administration to uh, do a temporary fix till we can find a permanent fix. Everybody go with that? Before you leave, could I talk with you a minute, please, sir? Okay. All right. Any further business? Any further business come from this board? We stand adjourned.